Hello, in this lecture we'll be discussing the last in, first out inventory method. At the end of this lecture we will be able to explain the inventory process under last in, first out, calculate inventory cost flows using last in, first out, record journal entries related to inventory cost flows using last in, first out, explain the effects of journal entries to accounts on the trial balance using last in, first out method. Okay, so we're going to start off in this location where we have the 100 units at $50 costing a total of 5,000 units. Now, the last in first out method, we usually uh, represent in contrast to the first in first out method because the first in first out method oftentimes is what most people would think of as the physical flow of inventory. But remember that all of these are just assumptions. Whether we assume that we, have, we are selling the first in first out the first units we sold being the first one units once we sell or we assume that we sell the last units that we got in first these are just assumptions and because they're just assumptions either one of them can be made so most people assume that a first in first out method follows the flow because most people would think that they would want to sell the older units first if at all possible within a, a physical flow assumption the contrast of the last and first out is a great contrast to that because it really demonstrates what the differences are if we make different types of assumptions. Either assumptions can reason reasonably be made as an assumption and therefore uh, it's a good contrast to see what differences can be made between the two different assumptions being made. So whether we have the two methods we could assume that we start off basically in the same spot being that we have 100 units at $50 costing us $5,000. If we look at that in terms of a trial balance, here's the $5,000. Remember that when we look at the trial balance, we're looking at it in terms of, of course, dollars. The trial balance is represented in dollars. It doesn't tell us how many units of inventory we have. It tells us how many dollars we have. If we want to see some backup of that number, then we could look at the general ledger. But remember that the general ledger gives us backup by date. The general ledger will give us show us by date the transactions that have happened what we want to see in terms of inventories back up by the number of units we have and the cost of those units also remember that in terms of these cost flow assumption methods such as lifo fifo and average cost we are assuming that the units are basically the same most of the time homogeneous units the same types of units that we are buying and then selling uh, in this process and in this case we only have the one type of unit that we are currently accounting for so if we then purchased 400 units at $55 then this is where we started off remember we've got the 100 units at $50 and now we're going to say that we purchased another uh, 400 units the cost is now increasing this is a normal cost flow assumption remember that even if we are buying the same type of unit over time, that unit will usually go up in cost, all else equal, because of inflation, just the rising of prices in general. That doesn't mean that prices can never go down when we purchase things, but it does mean that under normal conditions, we would assume that prices rise over time, and therefore that's the uh, problem we're going to take a look at at this time. So we're going to then record the cost of that purchase here, and we're also going to adjust our worksheet to back up that cost in the next slide. So let's see what that will take look at, look like. And if we look at our worksheet, then we have our start off of 100 units at $50 for the 5,000. I want to record basically all of our inventory now as of this box, as of this date, our new date. So if we purchased another 400 units at 55, we're going to put that in these three columns, represent the purchase column. We got 400 units at $55. That means we spent $22,000 for those 400 units. Once again, note that the price went up from $50 to $55. If we look at our inventory then, what we're going to do is just pull down this beginning balance. We still have that first layer of 100 units at $55. Where did that come from? We just copied and pasted it down here. Then we just copied and pasted over here the new layer. So now we have two layers. We got another layer, 400 units at $55. The price is increasing over time. That means that we have 5,000 units. 
I mean $5,000 of 50 unit inventory. We have $22,000 worth of 55 unit inventory, meaning we have 27,000 of inventory. If we look at the journal entry, there's, the journal entry is fairly straightforward. There's nothing, there's no estimates involved in this journal entry. We paid $22,000 for the inventory. That's what we're going to record. Inventory has a debit balance. We need to make it go up because we got more of it. How do we make something go up? We do the same thing to it, which in this case would be a debit. So we would put that on the debit side. Then we're going to assume, in this case, I'm going to assume that we paid for it on account. We didn't pay cash for it. We bought it on account. Therefore, the credit's going to go to accounts payable. Accounts payable has a credit balance. We need to make it go up because we owe more money after this transaction. Therefore, we're going to do the same thing to it, which in this case would be another credit. So we can see that the 5,000 inventory went up with a debit of 22,000 to 27,000, which matches our worksheet. So the worksheet is backing up that 27,000. And then of course the 12,150 of accounts payable went up in the credit direction with another credit of 22,000 to 34,150. Also note, there's no effect on net income. This is actually a loss at this time because there's no revenue. And there are expenses, 500 plus 300 plus the 9920 adds up to the 10720. That's a loss at this time. And therefore, uh, there's no effect on net income because none of the revenue or expense accounts were affected. When will they be affected? When we sell the inventory, <clears throat> that's when the cost of goods sold will be affected on the sale. So in this case, now we're going to say that we sold 420 units at a sales price of $85 each. So this is where we are at before this transaction takes place. Remember that we have the 27,000 units and uh, that is backed up by the this row. So we have this row being here. As of this date, we have 100 units at 55, four unit, I mean, sorry, 100 units at 50 and 400 units at 55. The question now being, which of those units did we sell? Did we sell the uh, 100 units at 50, the older ones, or the newer ones, the 400 at 55. Under the last in, first out method, we do what we think is kind of con counterintuitive to what we would like to do under a physical cash flow, and we take the later units first. We're going to assume the ones that we just bought, those are the ones that we are selling. So we're going to assume that we sold the 400 units, which cost the $55 first. Now, you might be asking, where does this $85 come into play in terms of this worksheet? And the answer is that the $85 is our sales price. Therefore, it has nothing to do with this worksheet because this worksheet has to do with the cost of the sale. So we will take the $85 into play when we sell the item in the journal entry. And we'll take a look at the journal entry transaction. This worksheet deals with the second piece of the transaction, meaning the reduction in inventory and the cost of goods sold of that inventory. We'll see that when we record the journal entry. So if we were going to uh, show this in our worksheet, then as of this date, we want to see everything that happens within under this new date box. So within this area down here, and therefore we're going to assume, remember that we sold the latest units first. So if we sold 420 units, that means we sold all of these 400s. We're going to wipe out that whole layer. So I'm going to say we sold 400 units at $55. We wiped out that layer. Then of the 100 units that cost $50, we must have sold 20 of them in order for the 400 plus the 20 to add up to the 420 units we sold in total. And those 20 units cost the $50. So therefore, the total cost of the goods sold under this method, the 22,000 plus the 100, um, would give us the 23 cost of goods sold. Under what we have left in inven ending inventory, we can say that of the 400 units here, we sold all of them. So of the 400, we sold, we sold all 400 and therefore have zero left at the $55. Of the 100 units, the older units, we're saying we only sold 20 of them. Therefore, 100 minus 20 means that we have 80 left. And, they're, and they cost $50, so 80 times 50 is the 4,000. We are left with 4,000 in ending inventory. If we look at the journal entry related to this, remember that we basically have two journal entries. The first journal entry can be a little bit confusing when we start to really focus down on inventory because it's a journal entry that 
relates to the sales side in which we don't even need this worksheet. So once we start looking at this worksheet, we start to maybe lose track of the first journal entry, which is the same journal entry in most regards in, in any type of business, meaning a service industry will still record this sales type transaction. Meaning if we sold something on account, then we're going to assume that we debit accounts receivable. Accounts receivable has a debit balance. We're going to make it go up because people owe us more money, assuming we didn't get cash for it, which we sold it on account. Therefore, we're going to do the same thing to it, which in this case would be another debit. Increase in accounts receivable. We're going to credit the revenue, income, or sales. We can call it whatever we want. In terms of a merchandising company, we, it's often called sales. So we're going to credit sales, which is our income account. Sales has a credit balance. We're going to make it go up by doing the same thing to it, which in this case would be another credit. Where do we come up with a 3520? We just need these two numbers in order to do that. The 420 units times the $85. And remember, that's the amount that if you go to a grocery store, obviously you know the sales price. That's what's on the sticker. Sales price times how many units, that's what we bought it for. What's not on the sticker is, of course, what the store, store bought it for. So the first journal entry would increase um, accounts receivable and increase revenue. The second journal entry accounts for the decrease in our inventory and the cost of that inventory. So if we think about the inventory, we have 27,000 that we started out with, and we're assuming that we sold 23,000. How are we making that assumption? Through the last in first out method, we're assuming that 400 units at 55 and 20 units at 50. Remember that these are the same types of units. We just happen to pay different amounts for them because the different time periods we bought them and the fact that in this case prices went up over time. So that means that we are going to have to reduce the inventory by the 23,000 and we know that inventory has a debit balance. We need to make it go down. How do we make something go down? We do the opposite thing to it, which in this case would be a credit. So we're crediting inventory by the 23. We're going to debit cost of goods sold. That is an expense account representing the cost of the units that we sold, the cost of the inventory. So cost of goods sold is an expense. Expenses have debit balances. We need to make it go up by doing the same thing to it, which in this case would be another debit. So we're debiting cost of goods sold. And so that would be the debit here. So we can see that inventory went down to 4,000 matching our worksheet. Cost of goods sold goes up by 23, which brings net income down. So what's the effect on net income of this transaction? It went up by 35.7, the sales price, the 420 times the 80 sales price. And then it went down by the cost of the goods that sold, the cost of the stuff that we paid for the goods, being in this case the 23,000. Therefore, net income went up in the credit direction of 12,700. So we're now able to explain the inventory process under LIFO, last in, first out, calculate inventory cost flows using last in, first out, Record journal entries related to inventory cost flows using last in, first out. Explain the effects of journal entries to accounts on the trial balance using last in, first out.